Today we're going to start discussing true medical or clinical microbiology where we're going to talk each week about one or two or a category of organisms and we're going to go through the virulence factors, the diseases that the organism causes, the specific treatments, the diagnostic tests, and any details within the diagnostic tests that you would need to understand the theory behind each test. So this week we are covering the gram-positive cocci and one of the major genera in the gram-positive cocci is Staphylococcus. There are several characteristics that you need to know regarding the Staphylococci. So Staphylococci, their morphology is it, that they are gram-positive cocci and they form clusters, characteristically called clusters of grapes. So under the microscope, you will see nice purple little circles that tend to bunch together. Keep in mind that sometimes Staphylococcus can just be in single gram-positive cocci or they can pair up. They're not always in these big, large clusters, but gen generally they tend to cluster together. Staphylococcus is a non-modal, non-spore-forming organism. It is non-fastidious or not fusty, fussy. It is a facultative organism, so it, it can grow in the um, uh, CO2 incubator. It can grow in a regular ambient air incubator. It will grow on various media. It forms yellow or white colonies with a regular convex morphology on agar media. The staphylococci are considered normal flora of the skin and the mucous membranes. And many, many people carry asymptomatically staphylococcus in their nasal passages and in other areas of the body. The key diagnostic characteristic of staphylococcus is all of the staphylococcus species are catalase positive. So that is a key feature and something you absolutely must know. So in general, Staphylococcus is spherical in shape. It, again, it usually appears as bunches of grapes. You could see on the right-hand side that there's a microscopic photo of your Staphylococcus in these nice clusters. Again, beautiful gram stain, nice purple, tiny little cocci. The genus Staphylococcus resembles the Micrococcaceae family members. So the Micrococcaceae family include the genera Planococcus, Micrococcus, and Stomatococcus. There are 35 recognized Staphylococcus species. 14 to 17 of these Staphylococcus species have been associated with humans. However, there's only a few that actually have been associated with causing human disease, and those are the ones we're going to focus on. There are several Staphylococcus species that are associated with animals, so they're considered veterinary pathogens. So all, I already said all Staphylococcus is catalase positive and how you differentiate the species of Staphylococcus, one of the key tests is the coagulase test. We'll talk more about that. So the coagulase test, all Staphylococcus are catalase positive and only a few are also coagulase positive. So the coagulase positive Staphylococci include Staphylococcus aureus, intermedius, delphini. There's several, several of these species, but the only one that we are concerned with and that we will discuss further is the organism Staphylococcus aureus, because out of these coagulase positive Staphylococcus 
species, Aureus is the only one that's a human pathogen. A lot of the Staphylococcus species are coagulase negative. And so again, the coagulase is one of these differentiating tests to differentiate your Staphylococcus aureus, which is the major pathogen in the, in the Staphylococcus species, from your coagulase negative staphylococci. So the coagulase negative staphylococci include staphylococcus epidermidis, saprophyticus, hemolyticus, simulans, ominous, xylosis. So there are, there are many species of coagulase negative staphylococcus. This is medical microbiology or clinical microbiology, so we are only going to focus on the species that actually cause human disease. So the most common species of Staphylococcus that cause human disease are Aureus, Epidermidus, and Saprophyticus. Less commonly associated with disease is Staphylococcus hemolyticus, ominous, and simulans. Again, there are some similar organisms to the Staphylococcus. There's Micrococcus, the genus Micrococcus, and these are free-living saprophytic bacteria. Planococcus and Stomatococcus. Planococcus and Stomatococcus are usually not clinically significant. In other words, they have not commonly been associated with the cause of human disease. The normal or usual transmission of Staphylococcus is person to person. Another common route is self-colonization, which means a person is carrying Staphylococcus as normal flora, and then the organism will gain entrance into the body through some sort of trauma or a wound. Also, Staphylococcus can gain entry into the body through surgical pr procedures. So since Staphylococcus is normal flora of the skin, it is very easy for this organism to get inside the body whenever the skin has an abrasion. I said that a lot of people carry Staphylococcus and so there are a lot of reservoirs for transmitting Staphylococcus from one person to another. And the common reservoirs of transmission are healthcare staff. So a, a, someone working in the hospital, a nurse, goes from one patient, doesn't wash their hands, doesn't change gloves, goes to another patient, and then can trans, transfer the staff from one patient to another. Patients, one patient to another patient, and inanimate objects. So a bed railing in a hospital can possibly be a reservoir. People with predisposing conditions always are at higher risk of infection. So people with predisposing uh, conditions, such as people that have chronic infections, people with indwelling devices, such as catheters, anyone with a skin injury, um, a trauma patient, a burn patient, and anyone that is defective in their immune response, such as chemotherapy patients. These types of individuals are at high risk of almost any infection, but Staphylococcus being normal flora of the skin and pretty much everywhere, these individuals are at higher risk of getting a Staphylococcus infection. We're going to start out with the what I call the heavy hitter. Um, you'll hear me refer to some of the organisms as the big boys, or you know, these are used the organisms that are notorious for causing disease. So we're going to start out in Staphylococcus with our heavy hitter, Staphylococcus aureus. The characteristics of Staphylococcus aureus are that it is the most virulent Staphylococcus species out of all of the Staphylococcus. It is the only human species that produces catalase. We already said that. That is very important. That must be ingrained in your memory.
It is the most common cause of skin infections. It's tolerant to high salt concentrations. That's another distinguishing characteristic of Staphylococcus aureus that will help to differentiate it from other organisms as well as the coagulase negative Staphylococcus species. Another defining characteristic of Staphylococcus aureus is that it's able to ferment mannitol, and it also is hemolytic. Staph aureus is found worldwide. It is commonly found in hospitals and nursing homes. It is normal flora in some individuals in the nostrils, on the skin, in the groin area, in the armpits. 30% um, of the population are persistent Staphylococcus aureus carriers. 20 to 30 percent of the population are intermittent carriers. So this is very important because you have a lot of people that are in interacting with sick patients, patients in the hospital, and they normally carry Staphylococcus aureus uh, somewhere on their body, and they're perfectly fine. Then you know there's no symptoms, no sickness, but you go and then transfer your staphylococcus that's normal flora on you to a very sick individual, that individual can get a severe, life-threatening, possibly fatal staphylococcus aureus infection. So up to 60% of people do not carry Staphylococcus aureus. Um, it seems, the data sh seems to indicate that the carrier rate seems to be higher in people within hosp the hospital setting. Staphylococcus aureus is normal flora of the skin and of the intestines. And again, it's very ha uh, common, commonly found infection in hospitals and nursing homes. I already said Staphylococcus aureus is hemolytic. So most of the Staphylococcus species, especially those that cause human infection, are non-hemolytic. Staphylococcus aureus, however, is a beta hemolytic organism. So when grown on 5% sheep blood agar plate, which as you recall from the very first lecture, is one of the most common general supportive media used in the clinical laboratory. So you'll see on blood agar, or BAP, SBA, sheet blood agar, which they're commonly called in the clinical setting, you'll see a clearing a zone around organisms of Staphylococcus aureus. I mentioned also that Staphylococcus aureus will ferment mannitol and the other Staphylococcus uh, species generally do not. So there is a special media that can be used called mannitol salt agar. This is an agar that contains mannitol with a pH indicator, so an organism that can ferment mannitol will lower the pH in the medium and turn the agar a color. So the medium is normally pink. If an organism ferments mannitol, it turns a bright yellow color. There's also a high salt content in this media, and most other org Staphylococcus organisms won't grow in a high salt concentration. So this is a good selective and differential media. If you recall from the one of the last lectures, we talked about all the different media. This one is selective because it contains salt in it for to inhibit the growth of other organisms. It's differential because it has a pH media in it a pH indicator in it, it has a sugar in it, and it indicates fermentation of a carbohydrate, in this instance mannitol. So again, this is a selective and differential media. Now we're going to go through the virulence factors that Staphylococcus aureus has. Now, I consider Staphylococcus a heavy hitter or one of the big boys in the Staphylococcus world. And the reason for that is Staphylococcus aureus tends to like to cause disease. And the reason is it has many, many, many virulence factors. Whenever an organism has lots of virulence factors or some really potent virulence factors, it is going to be a um, 
one that's going to be commonly the cause of disease. So this is a schematic showing all of the different potential virulence factors that Staphylococcus aureus has. So some of the key ones are that Staphylococcus aureus has invasins that allow it to get inside the body and to invade cells within the host, such as um, leukocidin. It has enzymes such as coagulase, hyaluronidase. It can produce various toxins, and we will talk more about the toxin-related diseases caused by Staphylococcus aureus. So there are different types of virulence factors, anatomical virulence factors, toxin production, we talked about toxin production in one of the first lectures, as well as enzyme production, and Staphylococcus aureus produces all of these types of virulence factors. The anatomical virulence factors produced by Staphylococcus aureus, in its cell wall, it has tachoic acid. It's a gram-positive organism, so it has tachoic acid. It does not have LPS, or lipopolysaccharide, or endotoxin, like we talked about in the previous lecture. Tachoic acid does mediate adherence to host cells. It also has a protein A coating on its surface, which will inhibit phagocytosis similar to what a capsule does, like we talked about in the la last lecture, where organisms that have this coating will not allow phagocytes in the host um, body to come in and gobble up that organism and kill it. Staphylococcus aureus also produces many toxins. It produces alpha toxin, which will hemolyze red blood cells, and that's what gives it its hemolytic reaction on sheep blood agar plates. It produces leukocidin, which is also called PVL for pentin valentine leukocidin. This will kill phagocytic cells so that, again, it can't be gobbled up by those phagocytes. It produces an enterotoxin, entero meaning enteric or intestinal, which will stimulate vomiting and, actually, and also diarrhea in the host. It can produce exfoliatins, which will cause the loss of the epidermis of the skin. And one of the more potent toxins is TSST1, which stands for Toxic Shock Syndrome Toxin 1, which induces a very severe inflammatory reaction. So the homolysins that hemolyze red blood cells, there's alpha, beta, gamma, and delta hemolysins. There's that leukocidin, pantin valentine leukocidin, and the enterotoxins. The enterotoxins are what causes food poisoning. There is a type of food poisoning that is caused by Staphylococcus aureus. So the AD enterotoxins cause food poisoning. The F toxin causes a toxic shock-like syndrome, and the B toxin causes pseudomembranous enterocolitis, which is a severe inflammatory reaction in the intestines. Also, Staph aureus produces exfoliatin, which we already mentioned will cause the loss of the um, epidermis skin layer. It causes staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome, which is a disease that causes the skin to just slough off an individual, or also Ritter's disease. And again, it causes it produces toxic shock syndrome toxin number uh, one, which causes the disease toxic shock syndrome, which is a multi-system disease that causes high fever, low blood. Uh, pressure, it can lead to shock and death. Staph aureus has the ability to produce many, many enzymes, such as hyaluronidase, which allows the organism to get into the body and through the connective tissue. It, it produces staphylokinase, coagulase, lipase, and also penicillinase that confers resistance to penicillin. 
Coagulase, one of the key enzymes that Staphylococcus aureus produces and one of the key ways to differentiate the Staphylococcus aureus species from the other non-coagulase producing Staphylococcus species. There are two forms of coagula coagulase, the free and the bound forms. So free coagulase causes coagulation, so your typical coagulation reaction in your um, whole blood. Catalase uh, catalyzes the conversion of water to, I mean, sorry, of hydrogen peroxide to water and oxygen. So it allows the organism to resist some phagocytic pro products. Um, phagocytes tend to induce oxidative products and ca uh, the catalase will convert things like hydrogen peroxide that are produced by a macrophage and turn them into more innocuous products like water and oxygen. Hyaluronidase is an enzyme that's known as the spreading factor and this will allow the organism to spread into the body and really invade into the tissues. And again, penicillinase is an enzyme that destroys penicillin, leading Staphylococcus aureus to be resistant to penicillin. The notorious Staphylococcus aureus is MRSA, or Methicillin-Resistant Staphylococcus aureus. This is due to the presence of the MEC gene in the organism. The uh, MRSA, or the MEC gene, alters the site at which methicillin binds in order to attack the bacterial cell and kill it. So the thing about MRSA, a lot of people say, oh my goodness, MRSA, it's so, it, you know, it's so pathogenic. In reality, MRSA causes the same types of infection as regular Staphylococcus aureus. Same types of infections, skin infections, all, you know, the same thing. The problem with MRSA is that it's very difficult to treat. So in a very sick individual that has predisposing conditions, if they get infected with MRSA and they're already very sick, it can be very difficult to treat those infections and that can lead to fatal infections. There are some uh, MRSA strains that seem to cause very severe disease and it isn't really clear yet if that's something specific to that individual that gets infected or if there are some MRSA strains that are you know, considered to be you know super pathogenic. There are people that can carry MRSA just like there are people that carry Staphylococcus aureus in their nasal passages, armpit, groin area. There are individuals that can be colonized with MRSA and don't have any illness at all. They just happen to be carrying a strain of Staphylococcus aureus that's resistant to methicillin. 